Just leave on blue, clear, take off, your left hand. Take off, left, with the sweet one. Left hand, swing west, copy. Hello and welcome to the Blue Skies Podcast. I'm P.R. Ganapati, your host. It is my great pleasure today to welcome to the program an old family friend and uh, the first air chief that we have on the program, Air Chief Marshal S.P. Thiagi. H. Marshal Thiagi was commissioned into the fighter stream of the Indian Air Force in 1963. Uh, initially flew Nats, Hunters, saw action in 65 and 71, and was in the initial batch of pilots trained in the UK on the Jaguar. He commanded uh, 14 Squadron, uh, the Bulls in Ambala, uh, on the Jaguar aircraft, was later AOC Jamnagar, one of the few people who's had the honor of commanding three commands, Central Air Command, Southwest Air Command, and Western Air Command uh, before he became chief. So we're gonna have a fascinating conversation with him today, but first things first, thank you so much for joining the audience of the Blue Skies and speaking to us, sir. Thank you very much for inviting me. So, sir, you know, we love to get to know our guests. So where did you grow up and what was your motivation to join the service? Did you have a family connection? What was your initial journey like? And what, what aircraft did you train on? What was that journey like? Okay. You know, as a young man, frankly, uh, I went to a school where there were, uh, uh, in that is San Javier, Jaipur, and there were a lot of these uh, landlord's sons, the Maharaja Dirajas of the Rajput kings of Rajasthan studying. And uh, they their preferred choice of profession was the Ahmad Corps. Uh, and therefore, a lot of people used to uh, join the NDA after senior Cambridge. Uh, unfortunately, I was not part of this, this landlord game. And I was uh, born in a lawyer's family and I was expected to take over the practice, law practice of the family. So the truth is, I was not awfully keen to join the armed forces. But the High Court of Rajasthan moved to Jodhpur. Jodhpur had the Air Force Flying College in those days. The Air Force Academy, so to speak, was in Jodhpur. And my father's younger brother, my uncle, uh, the senior bundle, as he's known as in the Air Force. He came and he was a QFI. Uh, he came to Jodhpur and he took me uh, to the flying college to for me to have a look. I saw all these young pilots flying, a very simple machine called the HT2 or the T60, the Texan, but throwing their parachutes behind and well, with the cigarette dangling from their mouth, uh, ordering a cold beer in the bar. And I was very impressed with all that. And so there, there you are. I just gave up the thought of becoming a lawyer and uh, joined the Air Force uh, at a very young age. I was not yet, uh, I was just beyond 17 and a half, which was the minimum age of joining in those days. And uh, in, in sometimes in early 63, I reported as a fly, uh, as a cadet uh, in, in the flying college. So actually, frankly, this was not my first choice to start with, but became my first choice after I moved to Jodhpur. Uh -huh. And you flew the HT2 in basic training and the Harvard in advanced training? Uh -huh. That is right. I trained uh, first on HT2 and uh, that is about 50 hours of basic flying on HT2 and then uh, about 75 odd hours on the Harvard T60 uh, in 
in the intermediate stage. This is the kind of flying we did in Jodhpur. Uh, regarding the flying, I would like to state that uh, first is uh, my remember. I don't. I don't know how I learned to fly. It is, it is quite some experience. But I did swing on my first solo, the HT2 swung on landing, and many of my course mates who had not made it as pilot said, "Oh my God, I see landing. So we can do it. Why are we leaving? That sort of thing." But uh, hey, all I remember as a cadet was that there were no holidays, no Sundays, no. Diwali, no Holi, no, no nothing. We used to fly seven days a week, and uh, the idea was to finish the course at, at the earliest. Uh, so it was one of the most hectic periods of my life. I finished my Harvard training, intermediate training in Jodhpur, and from there I moved to the jet training wing or JTW in Hakimpet in Hyderabad. Or Sikandrabad, to be precise. Now, so 63 was just after the 60, uh, 62 Chinese aggression. So your course was large, and there must have been an urgency as a result, isn't it? Yes, uh, but, but the, at that time it was large because finally, by 90, some people passed out. Uh, but I have to tell you that the amount of flying I did in the jet training wing throughout my Air Force uh, tenure of 40 some years. Uh, I never flew as much as I flew as a cadet in the JTW. I think 42 hours in a month. I had never flown flown that much after service, after I joined the service. And you were flying, flying the vampire there, I presume? We were flying the vampires and, and it was, you know, like I said, there were no holidays. The idea was to finish the course at the at the quickest. So our entire training from the time I reported till the time I got commissioned on JTW was uh, around nine months. So the one and a half years was compressed to about nine months. And you did your armament and everything during that time, is it? Yeah, well, there was no armament uh, really. I uh, In JTW, there was no armament. Uh, it used to be in the earlier era, they used to do an armament, etc., as an advanced training. But everything was topsy turvy in the post 62 era. And immediately after commissioning, we were, uh, I was pilot officer, and I have to say this, uh, Ganesh, that I was commissioned at the age of 18 years and nine months oh my so my first pay packet arrived before i was before my 19th <laughs> birthday wow so in your time after senior cambridge you could go straight to the air force academy yes well uh, you had to be an intermediate in those days you know class 12 uh, equivalent uh, today um, so I, I and i that's what i did uh, all I all I remember is that uh, when I joined the service, I never I wasn't yet shaving all on all seven days, <laughs> and I I do recall my instructor telling me, "Do you shave, son?" I said, "Sir, once in <laughs> in a week or once in twice a week," and he said, "I suggest you start shaving every day you now." <laughs> so I I was a little butcha at that time. Fascinating, fascinating. And then uh, which squadrons did you go to and what aircraft were they flying? Yes, I went to, I was posted to, as a pilot officer, to 221 Squadron, which was an old auxiliary squadron, vampire squadron, which had moved from Barakpur to Kalaikunda. And uh, it was commanded by squadron leader Chhatrat, uh, squadron leader Ram Batra and... Sorry, Flight Lieutenant Ram Batra and Flight Lieutenant Kohli were the flight commanders. And basically, it was nothing but a training squadron, really. And so instead of doing the advanced training in Hakimpet, we were uh, pushed into uh, these vampire squadrons. And uh, the life didn't start to uh, too well there because in the four or five or, five or six months that I spent in the squadron, I flew, I think, some like 15, 16 hours of flying. There were just not enough aeroplanes. And people, there were lots of officers who were 
men or detail to go to United States for training. But they had to have some 150 hours or 200 hours, I forget the figure, uh, on the vampire before leaving for United States. So the entire flying was concentrated on them. Since I was not one of those, none of my course mates were uh, heading for the US. Uh, I, we didn't get any flying at all. And uh, um, all, all I remember is that, that I think some 14, 15 hours or 18 hours of flying in, in, uh, in about six months time that I spent in uh, Kalaikunda. Got it, got it. it. It was bad. It was bad. I mean, they just weren't enough, enough aeroplanes. And we were some 35 or 40 officers posted to that squadron. So there was a bit of a not bit I'm, uh, I'm uh, there was a fair amount of chaos uh, on who's to fly who's not to fly to get a sortie uh, of flying uh, was was challenging to to say the least uh, but after six months stay in uh, Kalaikonda, um, mercifully we were posted to hunter squadron number seven squadron in halwara and uh, at least we were flying there you know so so Mm, suddenly life became a little more meaningful because these six months can be virtually written off. All we, we did was, I think, eat rations and, uh, you know, wasted our time mm. there. So, um, Seven Squadron Hunters, what, what was that aircraft like to fly? What were your experiences there? And did you become fully ops at that time? Uh, yes, I did. Um, in, in around June... So I have to uh, perhaps uh, recite this, that in 7th Squadron, as was the tradition in those days or the custom in those days, uh, pilot officers were not to be seen or heard. <laughs> so I I went there and uh, squadron leader Man Singh was my flight commander. And guess what, uh, Ganesh? Um, on the day I reported, in those days, we never had name tags on uniform we did not write uh, uh, the, our names uh, on our o flying overalls and actually in, i don't can't remember whether we put rank badges on our overalls as well uh, so it was impossible to recognize um, people by name unless you knew their faces uh, well i went and reported to the flight commander in seven squadron i had been briefed that you are to carry your log book and your blue book and you have to have your P cap on and go and report to the flight commander who will then take you to the squadron commander. So I knocked on the door and entered the flight commander's office and squadron leader Man Singh, who was the flight commander said, what do you want? <laughs> so I said, my name is pilot of Satyagi and I have been posted to your unit through your squadron. He said, then tell me, who is the flight sergeant in charge of the instrument section? I didn't know who this gentleman was, you know. Uh, I, I, and I don't think he knew who I was. Uh, so when he said, who is the flight sergeant in, in, in charge, uh, essentially in charge of the instrument section, I had no clue what he was talking about. So I said, I don't know, sir. And he said, if you don't know, then don't enter this office. Now get the hell out. Until you know the name of every airman on the DSS, don't come back. Wow. So I I went out. I didn't know what to, what to do. I put my P cap somewhere and my blue book and log book. And I went on the tarmac. And it, remember, it was the month of June. And the aircraft were parked out in the open. There were no blast pens in those days. And, uh, well, Punjab can get extremely hot in summers. Uh, I went and I saw one gentleman working on the engine of the hunter on the tarmac. And I said, since I had been told that I had to know the name of every airman in the, in the DSS, I started with this gentleman and I said, excuse me, sir, what is your name? And he said, Kapil Ghosh. How can I forget this name? Uh, so uh, I said, what is your trade? Because there were no uh, markers for trade in those days. Now we have a color coding. You can make out the trade. 
So he said, I'm Kapil Ghosh, engine fitter. And I turned around and walked off from the aircraft, repeating Kapil Ghosh, engine fitter, Kapil Ghosh, engine fitter, just to remember the name, the face and, and the trade. So we were brought up in a very different environment uh, because uh, we had to spend our whole day on the tarmac. And uh, once the flying was over, then we used to go to the RNS hangar. And there, uh, there was the warrant officer in charge of the RNS, uh, Mr. Mohinder Singh. It's RNS for and the audience who would... don't know what it is. Uh, can you just tell us what that is? Well, RNS is uh, where the second land servicing is done. It is, it is the um, repair and servicing. It's a centralized repair and servicing. Now we have a central system. In those days, the squadrons did their own second line servicing. You know, uh, uh, so we went to the hangar, all all of us pilot officers and warranters of Mahinder Singh would say, today I will teach you about the acceleration control unit of the Hunter engine. And we would say, but Mr. Mahinder Singh, you have done this yesterday. He says, sir, these are squad leader Man Singh's orders. And we would say, oh, then it is fine. Let's just carry on with your lecture. <laughs> so there was no formal MCF or structured MCF in those days, is it? Well, we did the MCF as well. But other than the MCF, we were under orders that till you can dismantle and assemble the Hunter aircraft, don't enter the crew. My goodness, wow. So um, throughout the day, we were in the squadron and in the afternoons, we were uh, in the RNS hangar taking lec where lectures were taken and we were shown and how to service the aircraft. And after the RNS hangar would close down and we were under orders that you will not pack up till the last airman of the squadron is packed up. Um, after it was uh, uh, shut down, then one of the flying officers stroke flight lieutenants was uh, detailed to take us out for an evening run. So we were taken, we used to go in our PT kit to the RNS hangar and then we would be taken on a jog or, or, or a run along the canal in Halwara, near the Halwara mess. And we were kept pretty busy till, till late in the evening. And frankly, we had no energy left other than to have a quick meal, get to sleep and <laughs> start the next day. So we, we were brought up in a very different environment. We were all, also much younger. Remember, you used to join NDA after class 10 or the Air Force after class 12 or the intermediate in those days. There was no class 12. Right, right. So very, very, very different uh, upbringing shall i say but but it was true for most people right so, so can we come to maybe the lead up to the 65 ops and where were you and what was the preparation like what was the mood like had you become fully ops by then on the hunter and Yes, I was fully operational on Hunter by that time. So the, the 1965 war, which was sta which started in September, on the 15th of September, if I re recall, uh, before that, there was a, in the summer of 65, around May, June, there was this issue of the Kutch operations. What had happened was that the Kutch in the run of Kutch the Pakistani tanks had entered and therefore the Indian Air Force had gone on alert. Uh, so we were on, well, some sort of, not some, alert. We were on an alert uh, in, in June 1965, few months ahead of the actual 65 war. Now, I... Uh, don't want to be awfully critical, perhaps we were a very young Air Force, but we were not as operationally oriented, I think, as we should have been. Uh, the amount of information available vis-a-vis -vis our enemy uh, Air Force, etc., was kind of limited. The amount of conversation that used to take place about war fighting was somewhat in my now now in my later years now much wiser uh, 60 uh, years later um 
was was sort of limited uh, but what was the advantage was that in 1965 in month of may june in summer of 65 a lot of people got attached from the training command to the squadrons and the squadron started orienting itself towards war fighting so it it was a kind of uh, you know a rehearsal or a prelude to what was to come but in i was fully operational but frankly i have to admit that as a young flying officer in the squadron uh, i was not a very experienced pilot and uh, i'm very i jokingly thank all my uh, squadron uh, mates of that time who were formation leaders i was not uh, that they were kind enough to take me as the number 2 with my very limited uh, experience uh, but what happened on 65 was uh, we were actually actually i think we had did not have sufficient knowledge of our enemy's air force air capability but when we lost four my vampires when the air operation started in the jnk region uh, i have to say that we all felt extremely extremely sad and may i say not off fully and not as confident as we should have been uh now it's long long time back but we were not as prepared as we are today uh mentally uh, not as prepared but i have to say that the individual skills were pretty good uh, people could fly that machine put that bomb on in the bucket who could fire the guns accurately fire the rockets accurately and at least individually we were pretty okay well trained but where whether we were awfully well trained collectively i don't know now i want to make a, one statement regarding 65 you know pakistan air force since pakistan had joined joined santo seato they used to exercise a lot with say the other nato air forces other center santo air forces other Uh, Seattle Air Forces, and therefore their exposure was immense. It is not that they were flying great machines. The F-86 good aircraft that it was was not, a, you know, something which is superior to what we were flying in Nats, uh, Hunters, etc. But I am just saying that their exposure was much more. That they, they seemed to be sl- somewhat better prepared than us to get into battle. uh today we are exercising with oh any number of air forces united states uk france um uh, oh and nearer home the middle eastern air forces the southeast asian air forces and today we would say that we know where we stand vis-a-vis the other air forces at that time in 65 frankly we had no clue uh as to where we stood vis-a-vis the other air forces i i all my memories of uh, 65 are that uh, i'm fortunate uh, i survived because my experience was somewhat limited so here here are one or two stories from the squadron what was the squadron tasked with and what sorts of missions did you fly sir yeah you know this is the other thing on 6th of september uh, the war started a uh, war started and the funny thing uh, ganesh is that uh, we were told not to strike the enemy airfields oh wow so, you know when you go to war when i say 6th of september the war started that means the lahore front was open that means till then the war was confined to the state of jnk as it was then called but um, the thing is that on 6th september the lahore front was open to ease pressure on jammu and kashmir because the army chief of that time general chaudhry had mentioned that they were under enormous pressure 
and therefore safety of Kashmir was in doubt and therefore we had to open the Lahore front. Till then, remember, the thought process was that the Jammu and Kashmir is a disputed territory and all warfare was confined to the state of Jammu and Kashmir. In 6th September, this thought was broken and we, the troops marched into the Lahore sector. Uh, well, shall we call it the Punjab Rajasthan sector? And uh, what, what happened was that the Indian Air Force was asked to go and take part in this strike. Now, when I say we were underprepared, one was we didn't strike their air, airfields because it was considered escalatory. If we strike their airfield, they will also strike our airfields. I think, I think that was the thought. And the second part was on the sixth morning, seven squadron took off in what is what was famously known as Tanga strike because uh, we were given no target and we were told to search and strike. So you go there, you find a target, then you hit it. If you don't, you don't. And, and uh, jokingly, somebody said, I, I fired at a Tonga. I don't know whether this story is true or not. And um, when the subsequent formation went, they found that the horse was still stunned and standing exactly where we had left them. But obviously, we didn't hit the Tonga well. Uh, long and short of it is, there were some areas where we did well and some areas which we did not do well. But on the 6th of September, Pakistan Air Force struck us with three F-86s, as it now turns out. Two of our hunters were shot down. They were now later Air Marshal Pingle, Pingo, and Air Marshal A.R. Gandhi, later Air Marshal. At that time, they were both either flying officers or one was a flight lieutenant, I'm not sure. Um, and they were shot down by uh, the F-86s before the F-86s could strike Halwara. In the same melee, two of the F-86s were shot down. One by uh, late Air Marshal Rathor, RATC as he was commonly known, and the other by my course mate, and then flying officer B.K. Neb, Vinod Neb. Uh, so, so we lost two hunters on 6th of e evening and we well, shot down two F-86s. Although another was claimed um, both by the hunters and the AKAC guns, but history now tells us that uh, the Pakistan Air Force lost two of their aircraft F-86s, both shot down by Neb and uh, and uh, Rathor and one of the pilots who was shot down was a famous, the famous squadron leader Rafiki uh, of Pakistan Air Force uh, who in whose memory Rafiki uh, airfield is named or air base is named. Uh, my, my total impression of 65 war was that we should have been better prepared. I think our performance should have been better than it was. I suppose you can say this for all wars. You know, um, debriefs are all about mistakes made. But I, I do believe we could have given Pakistan a much bigger uh, fight than we actually did. So how many missions did you fly during that, uh, the, during that time? Sir? I uh, I flew uh, I think five ground attack missions in which uh, we attacked some I didn't attack any airfield but we attacked some mainly logistic charges bridges uh, rive in the railway yard uh, train well we not train railway lines basically uh, five of five missions but I did not uh, strike any airfield. I also flew some air defense missions. That means we were scrambled a couple of times, uh, but um, I did not take part in 
any air to air battle one little story um, uh, guns that i want to share with you is that on 6th of september i mentioned um, pingo pingle uh, later air marshal prakash pingle uh, got sh- pingo got shot down uh, we assume by rafiki or his number 2 uh, and we all ran we, they ejected over over the base they were capping over the base when we ran towards them and picked them up and brought them and i do remember very distinctly pingo was a we used to call him the absent minded professor he was very quiet he used to stare into the <laughs> sky god knows thinking what but solid professional and i remember uh, the good maratha is saying when he, when we reached him chhodunga nahi inko chhodunga nahi inko i mean he was a man of few words uh, he, he was very very quiet but uh, he did men- mention this and it just so happened that uh, about a week later uh, he was he was back and flying very quickly and about a week later he and his uh, uh, number 2 and his course mate bancha was scrambled to intercept some aircraft and uh, he finally shot down uh, the pakistani aircraft one f86 and claimed a vrc but uh, i i have to say that enormous in one one 15 day war or the two week war uh, to be shot down and to shoot another one down i don't think in the, and anybody has this kind of experience in, in our air force yeah in fact i recall this conversation with him about his experience of shooting down that saber where he first had the paper on the cockpit and he was about to press the trigger when he said sala marega and then ha ah, and he humanity put- he moved the paper back away from the cockpit it was a very honorable act. i mean he shared this with us uh, immediately after when he landed yeah <laughs> it was a really sweet thing of him to do you know in, in that heat of the battle to you know even be so thoughtful oh well. brilliant 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 but prakash pingle is really uh, yeah, a hero in more ways than one yes of course Folks, that's all we have time for this week. My conversation with Air Chief Marshal Tiagi lasted almost three and a half hours, so we're going to break up the interview into multiple episodes. Join me again next weekend, and we'll talk to him about the interwar years when he became a Top Gun instructor at Tag D, and also his experiences in the 1971 war. part 3 will deal almost exclusively with his being selected to be one of the first few pilots to induct the jaguar the training that they went through in the uk and his experiences commanding a jaguar squadron when he got back thank you and jai hind